uh, Michan. Yeah, likewise. Um, been a big fan. Um, yeah, just love connecting with people who kind of think the same way. I know you've talked a lot about meeting people who are otherwise strangers and realizing, oh, actually, this isn't a stranger <laughs> at all. So. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the joys of of Bitcoin. And I guess you know, as we've, I'm sure we'll talk on talk about today. Anytime you encounter people that have such similar alignment on certain paramount values, the it makes it very easy to become rapid friends. You know, there's very little friction that that impedes that that process. And that's certainly been the case with Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. Um, so yeah, and and you know, this might sound weird, but um, you know, I've, I think I've been following you for quite some time. But you're one of those, and I, I spend as less time on Twitter these days um, intentionally. But you know, I see the stuff that you say, and I'm very often like, yeah, that's that's how I feel about that thing, you know. So there's a there's a, it's interesting when that happens, you know, that so many of us seem to be reasoning about things in a very similar manner and again hopefully we'll dig into some of that today yeah, definitely. um but yeah i noticed what you know uh in preparation for this one of the seemingly big undertakings that you've um been involved in, in the last little while is taking verveki's work and you know distilling it down into kind of bite-sized synopsis of of the different episodes of his awakening from the meaning crisis. So, I mean, we certainly don't have to start there today, but it seems like a, a decent entry point, unless you had anything else that you wanted to to kick it off with. No, I mean, I think that's as good as any. You know, why not just dive in the deep end of uh, existential <laughs> topic? <laughs> sure, yeah. sure, hit me. Yeah, so, I mean, it. you know, the reason I started, I think I started that project back in 2019. It was a very... Um, unexpected i discovered it in an unexpected way i think someone on twitter tossed something out like oh i wonder if anyone has ever transcribed or kind of captured notes on verveki's you know meaning crisis series i didn't know what it was at the time so i went and checked it out it seems super interesting and i think i was just it was at a moment where i just kind of kept I kept feeling so frustrated, like the internet has everything. The internet has everything and all I'm doing is taking from it. I'm taking from everyone. I'm taking, I'm reading, I'm ingesting, I'm downloading, I'm, I'm taking so much. And, and it, it, it felt like, I, and I couldn't find anyone that had gotten, had taken notes of it. Um, I only just learned about it and it was early because I think it came out in 2019. It must've just come out. So this person was kind of on it. And I, I, so I just volunteered. I was like, oh, I'm actually doing that right now. I replied to the guy. Um, I wasn't. But now that I said it, it forced myself to, to kind of get going on it. So, um, so I started digging into it. I mean, but the reason I, I chose, it wasn't just because it was an undone project on the internet that I thought I could contribute to. The nature of, if you watch that first episode, the nature of what it is he's trying to do is at the intersection of everything I'm interested in anyway. Um, I was really glad to have found it. And there must've been something about their request or the question that the person who tweeted out resonated with me. There was a reason I latched onto that and not the number of other things. Um, the way he's trying to address what he sees, and I think what we all feel um, or felt anyway, was kind of an existential issue happening at, at the societal level. People are struggling to find meaning. Um, in part because of, of, of the vacancy left behind maybe by the rejection of religion um, and that there is a God-shaped hole maybe for people, but they feel frustrated. They feel maybe um, it's inappropriate to even call it that, um, but it, it's leading to a number of problems and that the, the answer lies in a number of historical works, philosophical works, but also cognitive science. Um, so he's blending all these things. And I think what I like about it is he is in search of an answer, mm. of a remedy, of a prescription. Um, but it's deep. It's a 50 episode hour long each lecture series. And as you know, it's deep, it's rich. Um, but in going through it, I mean, I feel like even just by going through and capturing the notes, um, that's the only way to go through it. You have to go through it and digest it and take your time with it. I've since found after getting started on that, by the way, it should be noted that was before COVID ever happened. And, you know, this idea of existential crises and people being alone and wondering what it all means really hit a fever pitch once that hit. Um, yeah. In the course of 2020, people found my notes. They started leaving comments. They started highlighting it. They're like, oh my gosh, like it's, I'm so glad someone's doing this. This is really helpful. So it, it just felt, it felt like, oh my gosh, I finally contributed at least in my little corner, you know, 
um, a, something to, to the internet. And then it just, it, it's one of those Bitcoin mysteries. All of a sudden, all my favorite Bitcoiners are like, hey, have you heard about this meaning crisis thing? And I'm like, of course, <laughs> of course you guys found it. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible, man. And I think we all, well, I, I, I remember distinctly in um, 2014, I was living in China at a job that I didn't like. And uh, I had that same reaction. Like I just had that kind of moment where I was like, man, all I do is sh shove stuff in here, you know, and, and I probably pacify myself to a certain degree by thinking like that's sufficient. Like, oh, I'm smarter because I'm just consuming all this content and knowledge all the time and information. But it felt so like icky almost. I was like, but I'm nothing is coming out of it. You know, like I'm just not, it doesn't have much, what I'm consuming doesn't have much application for my profession. And so where are the fruits of this labor, you know, of, of this time sacrifice? And, you know, my response at the time was just to start writing. You know, I was like, I got to get something out. I didn't really know what. And so I was like, every morning I'm going to wake up and write for 30 minutes. Doesn't matter, you know, one of those exercises where you just put pen to pad and if it comes out and it's just fuck, 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 like that's fine. Or if it's some sort of, you know, you're, you're chewing on or working on an idea, that's fine too. And uh, I think that's a good way to approach it because inevitably it leads into something, right? It might not be like the end all be all on step one, but as you found out and as I've found out, and I'm sure many others, you know, action leads to action. And once you you get in that space and you start to train yourself to have output as well as input, then it also brings a, a greater salience and relevance to the input. Because now there's an objective, which is the output. And you can start to refine and kind of triangulate on what you want that output to be. And then of course, the output that you manage helps to you know, enhance that feedback loop of your own understanding of what you're interacting with and, and presumably trying to move toward. And with regards to Verveke, I mean, two points about him. One, as you say, I mean, that I think he did that in 18 or 19. And now he's he's kind of experiencing a moment, right? Like a bunch of Bitcoiners are interested uh, in his work. He's been on with Peterson several times and Pajo. And, you know, he was on Lex, I think, last week or maybe even yeah. this week re recently. Um, and even that, I mean, so that's five years after the fact, and he's still, I mean, he's done a lot of work since then, but he's still primarily known for that series. So, and, and that's just a commentary from my perspective on, you know, people don't always appreciate what you do when you do it. You know, sometimes it takes time and this is where the real, almost a kind of faith where you dedicate yourself to something regardless of the immediate feedback you're getting, because you know, on some other level beyond the collective or social feedback that it's meaningful and you know maybe it only ever remains or, or stays meaningful to you but chances are that if, if it's meaningful to you and if you've at least been somewhat considerate about how you are refining yourself and trying to what you're trying to become as a person presumably it has some relevance to other people and then it's just a matter of it kind of percolating out in the space long enough until you know people start to recognize it and and latch onto it and um, so I, I'm super stoked to see him start to get a lot of notoriety. I've, I've had two really enjoyable conversations with him. And then the comment on his work is just like, he needs someone to do something like you've done because it's so much, you know, I'm just blown away. Oh, you still there? Yeah. Okay. We had a, we had a little power glitch. So if we go out, we'll uh, just hang on the line and it'll come back in a few minutes. Yeah, no worries. Um, but yeah, I mean, his his depth of knowledge, like, you know, how many books he's read about all the, you know, the the ancient and modern thinkers on all these different disciplines that you mentioned. And then how, of course, he's synthesizing it all into to try to. You still there? You froze for me. Hello?
We back? We're back. <laughs> Where did I lose you? You were just talking about the, um, you're like, just to talk about his work, he's synthesizing all of these disparate like topics and things like that. And you cut out. Yeah. I mean, that was basically it just to say that, you know, it's a big undertaking because a lot of those works are, you know, a thousand page book written, you know, in 500 BC, and you've got to synthesize a pretty pristine insight to work into all the others that you've, uh, that you've been working on. And it's, uh, Anyway, all all to say, I just really appreciate the work he's been doing. It's great to see the notoriety he's getting now. Yeah, and you know, I just I did one. Um, I did it. I only have about ten more to go, maybe eleven or ten more to go. Um, I did one the other night, and I just n- looked at the view count of this episode, and it was like eight, you know, fifteen thousand or something views, something like that. Fifteen thousand views of this monumental work of intellect and synthesis, <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I mean. It's a commentary, I think, on the internet at how much is out there, how hard it is to maybe find. Um, it could speak to the audience for this kind of thing, but I don't know. In going through it so slowly and deliberately and capturing it, um, I didn't find it hard to understand. Um, I could see how people, in, in encountering some of these words, concepts, they are abstract, um, but you know, no more abstract than I think a lot of people are familiar with from you know maybe just some basic philosophical readings. I think it's just that. When you go through it at that pace, um, you know he does construct things in a way that things fit together. They build on one another. And when you're in, when you're hearing these him use these terms and he repeats them and he repeats them, they, they become integrated into your vocabulary. You suddenly start mm-hmm. thinking in those terms, and that, that that goes for probably everything. It doesn't yeah. happen so often with some of these abstract terms. And once you hear it so often, now I'm super comfortable with these terms. Um, it's not because I'm super smart. It's because I keep hearing them and keep hearing them. That's the word we use to describe this particular you know concept. And now I know it. And you just keep building on that. And um, so yeah, it was definitely a lesson. I think I think what you're hitting on though is very important. It's what resonates with me, and I and I don't know. Maybe you can relate to this, but all my whole life, I'm always reading very widely. I read science. You read literature. I'm reading sociology, anthropology, archaeology, mathematics. All these things. They're all individually interesting. I'm always trying to find that common denominator. How is this mm-hmm. relevant to that? What is this a me- is this metaphor to, for something? Is that metaphor useful or is it just a resemblance? I'm always trying to stitch these together. I'm always trying to find that synthesis. When I find someone who has oh. synthesized a number of different topics around a single point or a single discipline or a single topic, it's super appealing to me. There's something about that cohesion. Um, I think it appeals to something innate in all of us, but that's exactly what he's doing. He's taking all these threads that individually are very interesting. And you can read these things independently and say, that was interesting. That was interesting. He makes them now facets of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just so satisfying. And I, and I just, I'm on the hunt for anything like that. I think Bitcoin is one of those things. People have talked about all the disciplines required to fit together for you to get it, so to speak, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think Vivek, he's doing the same thing, I think, for this notion of meaning, meaning making, and and what it is we're looking for. Um, but yeah, what a tall order. I mean, to have read all of what he's read, all those ingredients, and him to synthesize that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really impressed by him and the fact, I don't know. I'm, I'm just really glad to see he's getting the notoriety, finally, that I think he deserves. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a good point in in terms of this is kind of cheesy and this would require more um, explication, but I think one of the things that we're all seeking is a type of wholeness, a type of integration with all the most relevant or most true forces that we have to contend with in our life as conscious human beings. You know, and this call it the enterprise of religion and philosophy and spirituality and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're trying to seek like what is the most integrated, the most true whole. And you, when you have someone like Verveke, I would say he's one of the people who's, you know, putting tentacles out in all the different places where people have tried to do this before and try to suck out the things that are, that integrate, that have the best fit with one another in an attempt to foster an integrated whole, which again, I think is what we're all looking for. And in terms of the meaning crisis, I would probably assert that that lack of integration or that disintegration that's occurring today is the the opposite of that and why there is so much demand for uh, these conversations or looking into this work or reading these you know, books new and old to try to make up for that dis- disintegration. And as you say, I mean, 
maybe God shave hole in, in one's heart is to, uh, is not secular enough for, for some people. Um, even though there may be a tremendous degree of validity in the assertion that whatever you think of religion and you probably think what you, your impression of it is probably wrong, at least to some degree, but the not having that thing functioning within you is causing some form of impaired integration or as by virtue of its not being there a disintegration because you you need something that it contains to maintain your integration as a person in the world you know and to optimize and refine yourself and actualize yourself to the extent possible and um what i find interesting you know with bitcoin is and because i've always been on this trip too you know like I've, I've always been extremely curious and like the idea of walking into like an old bookstore in an old town and going right into the back and the you know the bottom shelf and finding a dusty old book and open it up and being like having it the secrets of the universe in it like that was the thing that would excite me you know and my my imagination would would run wild with that kind of stuff but when it's when that's occurring in the context of a disintegrating world at least in certain respects it it does lack a relevance or a salience because it's like, well, these are very interesting questions and I'm naturally pulled to them for some reason. I'm naturally curious, but I don't at least immediately see their application in the broader world that I'm acting within. Oh shit. I think the power just went again. So oh, I no. might, I might, I might lose you. Okay. Um, but Bitcoin comes on the scene and it represents this thing that makes the world fit together or makes it relevant. You can see how the world could be integrated in a better way. And then that I think that calls forth or, or, or put, puts fuel on that curiosity. It gives relevance to that curiosity to say, oh, now like that fit that you might be able to find in those pursuits and the mysterious and the, the wonderful and seeking wisdom and knowledge in all these different places, you can see how it fits in and helps bring together what is now apparent potential on the horizon where before that wasn't available. And so I think there's many reasons why I think this whole Bitcoin phenomenon is fostering this intellectual renaissance, this, you know, people just kind of going wild, not, not solely for that reason, not solely for people's attempt to understand what Bitcoin is, but, you know, the rabbit hole is deep as we both know. But I think that's part of the reason why so many of us are, are now revisiting, not only out of necessity for being in a cultural moment where that meaning, that aspect of our meaning making has been diminished or disintegrated in some way, but now having not only that, but an attractor to, to pull it out of us and to in incentivize or inspire us to move toward it. I think all that's really well said. And I think you, you hit on a number of important things he talks about, right? Right there. And, um, you know, you have me thinking about how profound a lot of this really is because, yeah, I mean, a lot of what you just said is just how interesting it is that the integration, and you're right, he draws attention to the etymology there of disintegration, right? Um, and how important a concept that is and, and as a word, but that the integration of knowledge, of disparate forms of knowledge creates, is done via this form of kind of synthesis or analysis. That, that kind of connects them in an interesting way. And that in, in, the, in the pursuit of that or in, in the fulfillment of that, people find themselves more integrated. And to the extent that different threads are, are, are being unwound and lost and we have disintegration, people feel untethered from the world and are experiencing subjectively a disintegration of the world from the world. And that that's a very interesting comparison um, that I think he's making and that in the act of doing what it is he's doing with the Awakening with the Meaning Christ series and, and, and providing this synthesis, it's an effort to create the thing that will allow people to become well integrated. But I think that's profound. And I think it's important that people realize that the integration of different topics, and I think Bitcoin does the same thing, uh, leads to an internal, a spiritual, a subjective integration as well. Um, I, I would urge everyone to, so to speak, like kind of pull on that thread a little bit. In going through 
Verveke's work, and, and, and you probably found this as well, like a lot of the words you were using to describe things, um, you know, fittedness, right? Relevance realization, like, okay, this is an interesting topic in service of what? Like, why is it good for me to know this? What, and what is it for, right? In, in what way is this useful? How do I use this? And finding the optimal fittedness to things. And he keeps emphasizing these words. And I think one thing that happens, I and mean, I think it's with Verveke, but I think it's with any topic or subject of sufficient depth, they draw attention to words and, and words we take for granted. We have to in order to use them, right? And you start to learn and, and he, he focuses and he's like, remember, this is where this word comes from or notice this word, look at what comprises this word. So even the way the words are integrated and suddenly you have an insight and you're like, ah, disintegration. I never thought of disintegration like that, like disintegration, but also integrity. When you are integrated, you have integrity. He, he, he points that out and you're like, oh, is that what integrity is? Integrate, I'm integrated in some way. And so- yeah. But again, these are, these are, I think, insights dotted along this journey. So you have one of those insights in the middle of a lesson of his, <laughs> and I'm like three lessons in. So you can see why it does take a little time and maybe it is lost on people as maybe being too deep. But I think his emphasis on practicality and um, usefulness, I think sets his, sets his work apart that I was actually really surprised by. I, I do find it interesting and, and, and um, well, it's not just interesting, it's helpful right? He's, he's trying to do something and help people and make it useful for people. And I think it's very approachable. So I'm taking this opportunity to encourage people. If this sounds intimidating and lofty, it is not. Take your time with it, but it's, it's very useful and, and very practical, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I'd actually like to ask you to put some meat on that bone in terms of how it's been useful and practical to you, because I think as you pointed out, that question of, you know, what you're striving for determines the rel you know the relevance or the salience of the things you encounter you know or you could say in petersonian language it it determines what your value hierarchies are and how those will mediate between self and world to move you towards the thing that you want to achieve and so the burning question is and the question that i do think you know wisdom traditions philosophical traditions religious traditions necessarily must grapple with perhaps as their most important thing is what is it one should be pursuing because that's going to dictate everything that everything else. And so I, I'd, I'd love to throw that over to you, but um, just for a moment, the, the comment on etymology, it's always been something that um, I was super interested in. And, you know, as, a, as an anecdote, when I was in school, I mean, like any kid, I kind of, for most kids, I, I hated studying, right? I was like, this is, I just got to remember all this crap and I'm going to forget it after the exam. And, you know, what's the point? And some stuff I was interested in, like, you know, I, I found history interesting and whatever else. But one of the minor hacks that I, I found out could help me on that way that they never really teach you in school, especially in the early days, is like when you're asked a question on an exam or something, typically, like if it's a multiple choice or, you know, if you have options, usually the answer can be found in the words that are given as your options, right? Mm -hmm. If you just think about how the word is constructed, like you said, like it should be apparent that the answer is probably the word that if you deconstruct it relates to the question that's being asked. And I always found that kind of like a, I don't know, a sneaky little hack to get a few extra points on an exam or something. <laughs> but it is interesting because, you know, these words come to be formed as a result of our attempt to, to almost externalize something that we're like a, in, an internally held notion or idea. And so we're, we, we, a feeling even, or an emotion. And we say, well, like how we need a word to, to, to explain this idea of all the most true or the best forces coming together. And as a result of them coming together in their most, in their highest expression, let's say, or in their best fittedness, the benefits to be derived from that state, you know, and then a word like, integrity comes up, which means that it's meant to convey the bringing together of all the best forces, let's say. And in, in modern, like colloquial language, we, integrity is like, you know, kind of means like someone's honest or they're like a decent person or they're good. And that is true. But I think the truer truth about it is, is that integrity means that this person is actually almost optimally grounded in truth. They've, they've fitted themselves to the most relevant truths both about themselves, about their ambitions or their goals, and potentially about something far larger than that. And, you know, these, 
mythic figures and hero characters throughout the ages, you could almost describe them as being the most integrated characters. Like this is an example of an optimally integrated being with the forces that are most optimally integrated with or to, mm-hmm. right? Because you, you know, perhaps, and that, and, and again, that, that brings up the question of, well, because what you're striving for will dictate which forces you attempt to bring to bear within yourself to, to move towards or to actualize. And so the assertion there is, you know, the, the hero is the person who's integrated the most relevant aspects of themselves for the world around them in order to become the best possible version of an individual, let's say. Yeah. Um, when things are aligned, I, I, I think in, integrity is a great word for that reason, right? Yes, it means you know honest and they are trustworthy and all these things. But what that means is they do what they say, right? They don't deceive and like their values and what they say is not misaligned or divorced or disintegrated from what is true, what they right, do, right? right? And you really trace it back and you're like, oh, okay, it doesn't, it does, it actually does make sense, right? You know, this whole topic of etymology too, I just, I need to like, this is my little uh, pet peeve or whatever, but I really get annoyed when people say, oh, well, that's just semantics. Yeah, I don't want to quibble about semantics, right? Like semantics is the meaning of words. Like, <laughs> that like, doesn't matter what, anymore though, Mark. You, guys, have, have you not been what, observing things lately? What, uh, what else? Is, it's all, words are all we have. Words are all we have or else we're just bashing people over the head with weapons and things. Like literally it's all we have. So yeah, the meaning of words, sorry. All I want to do is get into semantics, right? Because it's important that we use this, that we understand the words to be the same thing. But I don't know. It's a funny little um, throwaway line that people still say from time to time, and I don't think they're thinking about what they're what it is they're saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that in- integrity. Um, there's a literalness to that, and I, I yeah, I encourage people to think about that. Like, oh yeah, wow, that that is what integrity means. And now go interrogate other words too, and what do they mean? And well, what did they mean? And now the meaning has been corrupted a little. Good, good to know, right? Maybe we can bring that mm-hmm. back. But um, I think interrogating the meanings of words; those are the bricks on which you can build things like what Verveki has built. But you have to kind of get back to those, the meaning of word. What do they mean? What am I saying? And then you can you can build arguments or or put forth kind of excuse me, ideas. So yeah. Uh, I know this is a big and probably challenging question to answer and and certainly answer in kind of isolation because, you know, how do we know that the different things that are influencing us, how is one thing, not the other. And then you have, you know, Bitcoin thrown in and that's very uh, influential for many of us, but, you know, studying Verveke's work as you have and going down that particular rabbit hole, you know, we, we just alluded to kind of the importance of determining or gaining ever greater clarity on that which you are attempting to become or move towards. How has that influenced, you know, your pursuit in that regard? Um, the, the way, in one very important way. So rather than ramble on about a bunch of different things, I'll try to synthesize the way in which it, it did it for me. Um, it's called awakening from the meaning crisis, right? And I think I was attracted to it because I think I appreciated or at least felt that there was a meaning crisis somehow, right? Like people are struggling to find maybe the meaning of life or just the meaning of their own life, the meaning of everything. I don't know. Um, it, it's the question. Um, it also is interesting that I was just talking about the meaning of words, right? It's another use of the word meaning, but you know that word seems to underlie a lot of things, Um yeah, what, what am I striving towards, right? What is my goal? What, what, what am I here for? What, what is the objective here, right? Which I think is kind of what your question was, right? Like, what is the meaning of my life? What am I after? Um, I think we all bring that to the series and are trying to figure out, you know, what, what is going on here? Or, you know, given what I learned from the series, how does that change how I then go through life, right? I think what Verveki highlights is that when, let me, let me take it back a bit and talk about if you are judging the usefulness of an object, right? Um, or the use of an object, let's say a glass on the table or a cup, right? Um, there's nothing intrinsic to this object and the, and the shape it has that makes it useful to you as a cup. The other half of that is what you bring, which is your need for something that can hold a liquid and you look for things that satisfy a certain set of requirements that actually make it so that you know it's sufficient in fulfilling that goal. Um, and, and the word he uses for this meeting of kind of need and capability 
and in between that lies usefulness and that there needs to be someone using something in order for the thing to be fitted enough to the the use that is in need and he refers to this in between this as like trans transjectivity right this in between relationship between object and subject that out of that arises something right um the, the transjective nature of reality, the give and take, the fact that there are two sides to things as opposed to, oh, I am here and the world is there. I am interacting with it, but it is a thing in and of itself um, is a um, is not a helpful way of, of thinking about things and seeing things. So to answer your question, I think the more you the more time you spend with the series, the more you realize how much of you you're bringing to the answer of what is the meaning of things and it forces you to reflect on yourself more than I think people feel comfortable to or more than they maybe felt was deserving um I am nothing I'm trying to understand this big complex thing out here because I'm just a little person I'm just trying to understand where I you know can fit in right to this whole thing um the mere perception and understanding and processing of this is a relationship you are bringing so much of yourself to the meaning making experience it forces you to think about yourself and say, well, who am I? What unique things do I bring to the table? What is my lived experience? What is my perspective? What are the, the abilities that I have? How am I uniquely suited to serve the world? Out of that comes, ah, these are the types of things that other people find valuable. And I don't even think anything of, I just do them naturally, right? This is actually kind of fun for me. Other people struggle with it. Other people literally can't understand how I can do these things. Like, I don't even know, like, I could never do that. Like, ah, okay. So in, in, in reflecting on yourself, what you bring to the table, my vantage point, my perspective, my biases, my thing. And so out of self-reflection comes a better understanding of how I best fit into the world. And I think a lot of people don't do that reflection part. I think they're trying to look and try to understand something out there without realizing it's a bit of a relationship. And you need to actually get a really better understanding of what it is you're bringing to your understanding of things and how, if that makes sense, that, that transjective mm -hmm. nature of, of, of things is it's that third perspective. It's the, it's the thing that arises from, from the interaction between the two. And so, I don't know, I think people have a larger part to play in the meaning of their life and the meaning of things. And I think hopefully it emboldens you. Um, I, I, I don't want <laughs> to put too much pressure on his series, but I think in, if you truly kind of get to the bottom of this, it emboldens you to feel more confident to, putting more of yourself into the world as opposed to maybe taking from it or maybe deferring to the nature of the world and conforming yourself to it, feeling a little bit more emboldened to bring yourself to it because out of that relationship between yourself and the world is where you'll probably find a lot of the answers you, you seek. So out of all of his investigation and his, you know, bringing to bear the reemergence of, you know, wisdom from a bygone era and synthesizing it together, you think one of the most impactful outcomes of consulting his synthesis is being inspired to engage the world more and perhaps more consciously and more um, self interestedly, maybe self-reflectively, the way he built his arguments is through, hey, look, you know, here is, you know, here are famous, here's how famous philosophers have thought about it, or scholars, or, um, you know, very deep thinkers, and, and they've wrestled with this problem. And here are some principles that they've, you know, come up with. But he also touches on um, cognitive science and some psychological principles and certain ways in which they've experimentally deduced things. And, and what this does, I think it just shows you, it, 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 um, it shows you the architecture of kind of how different people have, have thought about things. But I think what isn't said, but um, all of these people were uniquely suited to ask the questions they were asking, right? Um, it wouldn't have occurred to some people to ask certain questions in a certain way or go so far into things. And so, yeah, I think, I think that um, he, he, he doesn't say this, but your perspective matters and it's important. It's, it, it's an important piece of the puzzle. It's an important part of the integration process. So don't be afraid to, and you know, don't say, well, what's the right answer? It's like, well, you need to bring a lot of yourself to the table. You need to actually reflect on what it is that is unique about your perspective. And I, you know, I, 
I think a lot of people are reluctant to do that, especially in the academic environment, the scholarly kind of environment. They're just trying to get, you know what I mean? Like they're trying to learn things. It's very much like an in, in, intake uh, process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's, I think that's one thing I've gotten out of it. I can't say that everyone gets the same thing, but yes, I would say that is the number one thing, that transjective nature of meaning making and the, and the fact that it's more of a relationship than it is an understanding. Mm -hmm. Again, understanding, like standing under something, it's more of a relationship. Um, very helpful, subtle, and I think it, 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 um, it has shown up in my life in, in maybe subtle ways, but I'm a little bit less... Um, I don't know, shy, reluctant, you know what I mean? Meek mm -hmm. as it relates to my opinions about things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not hard to understand why in a fiat era, in an era that is increasingly dominated by top-down decree that people would, it would inhibit or, um, you know, make people more apprehensive about attempting to find answers within when orders are so available externally, you know, and they show up in different ways, of course, in the academic realm and the political and the economic, et cetera. But um, I think there's some truth to that. And I think even before Bitcoin, you know, perhaps as a result of the internet, you know, the free flow of information, the access to, in, in, uh, to information that people were starting to, uh, well, think about, broaden the scope of the ways in which they thought about themselves, perhaps as a result of the different perspectives that they then had exposure to or access to. Now, that's a double-edged sword because, you know, when you, as the internet develops, you are also uh, being impressed upon by all sorts of different algorithms and people's wills and manipulation of various kinds. And so, you know, maybe there's some good and some bad there, but, um, but I agree that that's a very worthwhile and important thing to do and to the extent that um, his series has instilled that in people, that's great. One of the things that he, well, one of his objectives is, you know, the so-called religion without a religion, which is kind of, you know, uh, paying lip service or appreciating the fact that religion has a lot of baggage and the secular world, you know, it may not, it may not be able to make a comeback as far as the secular world is concerned, you know, for whatever, a, a multitude of reasons, they've kind of left that behind, but recognizing the central importance that we alluded to already of the religious idea or, or what you might call religious behavior. And um, so I'm just, you know, after consulting a bunch of his work, I'm curious what you think about that notion. Yeah. The religion without a religion, he understands the importance of, a, of religion. Um, by the way, I, I do too. Um, I think this is something I, I brought to the series that maybe that's why it kind of appealed to me. I, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and there's a lot of value. I know you talk a lot about this as well. I know you can appreciate this point. There's a lot of value. I think that religions brought at least insofar as they had survival value. I mean, obviously, right. At the species level, um, there are rituals and practices. I think everyone can understand the value of rituals and practices and they, they're essentially habits kind of writ large and, they, they allow us to do things in a subconscious level um, and pass on traditions and things like this. Like there's a lot, there's a lot there. And if you toss mm -hmm. out religion, you toss out those things as well. And I think that's what happened. I think science was put in place of that as the more analytical um, substitute um, for interrogating reality and understanding things and, and really coming to grips with um, how the world works. Right. And I think that, sure. Yeah. That, that also, by the way, has a ton of value and I'm a big um, appreciator, I think, of the scientific method. But I think, um, you know, increasingly, people need to understand its limits. And um, just as they need to understand the limits of religion, and I'm the first to say that religion brought with it a lot of terribleness as well, which I think Verbeke highlights. Um, so what's the way forward? Um, I don't think a lot of people like to admit that science has its flaws as well. And even the scientific method has its, has its flaws. A lot of the... Um, insights that have come from the world of science end up being born through experiment and then later scientifically analyzed in order to kind of find out what's the mechanism happening here but the breakthrough came through kind of an intuitive playfulness or an intuitive kind of like tinkering um out of which comes something that works right um so i i think that um in, in the religion he, he sees the need for something that g gives us all like what religion does for us i think at the um biologic level or just at, at the cultural level, which we've obviously kind of like had 
brought with us through millennia of generations. Um, I think what he's, uh, you know, I think it's a worthwhile pursuit. I think a lot of people want that as well. And I don't know if everyone's appreciate I, or is admitting to themselves that um, they, they do want something in, you know, that I think religion used to serve that we don't really have anymore. Um, again, it's this third thing. It's this, you know, and I, I almost feel like a lot of what he does is the blowing up of the binary distinction of things, right? Mm -hmm. either, either, you know, belief for science or this or that. And he's like, yeah, I, I think what he's describing with the religion that's not a religion is this third thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big um, advocate of the, you know, the third place. I don't know if you've heard this expression where you have work, you, know, you go to work. This was back when we actually commuted to jobs and things. I guess a lot of people still do. You have work, you have home. A third place was the place that wasn't work and it wasn't home. It's like a cafe or a park, mm. a place you could go and maybe meet with your friends before you go home, right? Or before you go to work, you can kind of go do your thing. And the people have a need for a third place, right? I, and I always like that. Like for me, it's coffee shops, it's cafes. That's where I can read. Sometimes I don't want to read at home. Being home brings with me a lot of associations and connotations. And I just, it's hard, you it, it easily get distracted and there's things to kind of do. There's errands, the, you know, house is dirty. And then work, of course, is a place where you go to get things done. It is helpful to have this almost um, liminal space to kind of get work with ideas or just kind of let off some steam or do something. It, it seems like um, there's something, I think he appreciates that in betweenness of things. I, I, it's one common thread I see coming up. And I think that with the religion, that's not a religion. I, I can't imagine anyone feeling like, oh, that's, you know, why are you looking for that? You know, we're good. We either have religion or you don't want religion. No big deal. I think a lot of people are like, actually, that would be nice. That would be yeah. nice if we could have something like that, you know, so. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. It's one of those things, though. I, it's like, I want water without wetness sort mm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, first of all, and to your point about, you know, the in-between space, I agree, but I feel like as with anything, there's a hierarchy and there's a place where you feel most at home, most integrated, you know, and this happens on every kind of plane, whether it's internal and psychological, conscious, subconscious, physical, what have you. A great example is like, let's say you're walking home from being out at the bars or something. You know, once you step out in your street, in your dark alley, this is a highly chaotic environment. You don't know who's around the next corner. You're kind of anxious, all that kind of stuff. As you get closer and closer to your home, the anxiety goes down. You're getting closer to that inner sanctum of security and order and knownness. And then you get into your house and your porch and, oh, that's even better, but it's not the most yet. And then you pass through the, your living room, you go up the stairs, you pass through the in-between space and upstairs, and then you get into your bedroom. And that's the, you know, that is basically the most home physically for a lot of people that you can feel. It's the place that's most controlled, most, most safe, most known, most ordered, all that kind of stuff. And I think the same is true on whatever scale or landscape we're analyzing that. Like we can't, uh, the answer is in between. I don't think is going to be a satisfactory answer for, for anybody, you know, and um, this is why I'm not sure. Many, many have tried to uh, not throw the baby out with the bathwater before or whatever the, however that analogy works, like keep both or, you know, throw out the wrong one or the, the, the worst one, uh, the bad one. But it, I don't know if they're separable like that. And instead, I think, well, th this is not going to come out as a definitive fully formed thought, but broadly speaking, I think all action is religion i mean if, if we want to go back to etymology and the the use of words and stuff we were saying before you know you can ask someone like hey man like how are things been going like what have you been up to lately and i was oh like i've uh, been really interested in bitcoin lately I'm, I'm pretty much devoting myself entirely to you know contributing to bitcoin and orienting my career around that it's like, oh devoting you're, uh. you're, you have a <laughs> devotional relationship to this thing yeah. now it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm giving up all, all, almost all my time to it. Oh, you're sacrificing all of your time to this thing. Interesting. You know, and we could play that game out, I'm sure, on, with a number of different words and a number of different actions to the point where, again, I think the, the religious assertion is, is not so much in the actions that it inspires. It's recognizing that all action 
is devotional. All action is sacrificial. All action is is worship. The the kicker, the thing that for since time immemorial that humanity has been trying to understand is which actions are most rightly or which which ends are most rightly devoted to which ends are most worthy of our sacrifice and the whole paradigm that we we may be existing in today where there seems to be you know this this scientism or this materialism that that prevails in an effort to kind of uh not deal with the religious problem or question seems to be kind of like a an is masquerading as an ought you know just the 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 investigation and complexification of the material world for the sake of it hmm. but that's almost an impossibility right your you, whatever your action will always reveal what you're most devoted to the thing that's most meaningful to you regardless of what you say what you think you're about anything right the actions will reveal that and so I in that's what I mean when I say I think all action is religious and it's incumbent on each of us to determine what our religion is. Is our religion ourselves? And I think you can make a strong case in this fiat era. And of course, fiat is not the only thing that characterizes this era, but you know, I'm speaking to a Bitcoiner here. Um, that it's become so self-centered, where everything is in service of the self. And is that the best orientation to have? to be the most integrated individual possible, not just only integrated in reference to you and your own aims, but integrated in re reference to you, your own aims, the community and the culture and society that you act within, the very constituents of the, the broader reality. Like that's what true integration, I think we probably both agree means. And so is the religion of the self and aggrandizing the self and accumulating material things to the self and associations, is that the most optimal religion to have? And this is the place where I think we can go back into former religious traditions and former philo ph philosophical traditions, theological, et cetera, and say, oh, this, this topic has come up before many times. And the answer is always no. That is not <laughs> the best you know, yes. way to con constitute your own personal religion. Okay, so devoting myself exclusively or primarily to myself, to my aggrandizement. Many people have dealt with that. It's, you know, and, and the answer is pretty much always the same. Mm -hmm. What then? Mm -hmm. What is the thing to aggrandize? What is the thing to worship? What is the thing to, to celebrate, to glorify? Again, we're, we're using all these religious terms again. And that I think is the question. So I, I don't, my, disagreements too strong but like when i encounter someone like Raveki saying like what we need is religion without a religion i think that's the wrong framing i think human beings are religious quote unquote religious creatures now that'll again uh that'll probably trigger a lot of people and hopefully they understand it in the terms that i just laid out not in their their a typical understanding of religion and i think there's even like a there's a, a formal name for this, like homo religious or something like oh, that. Yeah. Um, spiritualis or whatever. But yeah, so, so I think we, we need that. And the, the more we recognize that what we devote ourselves to, how we spend our time, how we, do, how we sacrifice or exchange our forever limited time and resources, we are doing so in service of something. We are trying to bring something more into the world through that method. We're trying to aggrandize or celebrate or glorify or express something as a result of that. And the question is, what should it be? And it may be the case that, you know, the religious critique is backwards. You know, people say, oh, like there's no bearded man in the sky. Uh, that's so absurd. And he doesn't have any control of my life and all that kind of stuff. But the directionality of that should be different and, and rather say, what is the thing that inspires my, you know, as I refine myself and as I learn and as I become actualized and as, as I become integrated, what is the idea that allows me to do all those things in the way that manifests the best result? I will call that thing, idea, notion, whatever, God. And that is a natural consequence of how human consciousness interacts with the reality that we find ourselves in. 
now all that might be wrong. Obviously I'm just spitballing here, but, um, I, that's, I guess, part of my, um, commentary on, on Braveke's attempt at a religion without a religion. I really like that. I really like all that. And I think, well, it's, it sounded to me like what you're doing is reframing it. You're, you're pushing back on Braveke and saying, well, I, that you think religion is a little bit more of an adjective and a verb than it is a noun, a thing that you, it is a thing yeah. and it's an institution. You're saying, no, you do things religiously. Um, you do things with a sense of all these, you know, kind of religious devotion or religious kind of, you know, it's something that you actually, it's a way in which you do things. Um, and I think you also described something I feel um which I, I hope didn't get overshadowed by my talk of the self, but being in service of something, helping something, contributing to something, right? Um, that, it, it, you know, for instance, I can speak for myself, like this is not, I'm not interested in like my career or my name, honestly. Like, you know what I mean? That's not, that's a zero interest to me. You know, I, I want to develop a good reputation. I want to have integrity as a person, but what am I, how am I helping? I'm always thinking that, right? I'm always asking myself, how am I helping? And like, who, like who, like how am I most contributing? How, like, what am I serving, right? Um, I, I have a question for you because I think, I mean, we both found Bitcoin, I think that I'm, I'm going to go back to Bitcoin for a second. It does feel like a source of gravity that attracts a certain maybe type of person or just attracts, honestly, maybe a lot of things or everything, right? um eventually eventually right um <laughs> but it's a gravitational source i feel like a lot of people found bitcoin and then and then uh developed or became a certain way maybe they developed a lower time preference maybe they uh started thinking about things and questioning things and then they changed their their actual behavior as a result of maybe some um events after discovering bitcoin you know i had a number of things before discovering and i think not just discovering bitcoin i mean my bitcoin rabbit hole goes back a ways but appreciating it fully appreciating it really connecting the dots they connected dots that i had already brought to the table for me mm. right there was an integrative process there and i felt then more confident in certain perspectives because now i knew where they fit yeah. but I, but i was developing them in isolation for so long and bringing them i, I had certain values and bitcoin um everything conformed to, to, to what Bitcoin is. And I know that sounds so crazy, not to you, but probably for anyone who isn't familiar with Bitcoin, <laughs> that sounds like a crazy statement. Um, yeah. It's like an, it's a free open source code base. Like, what are you talking about? But um, I guess my question to you though, because when we talk like this and when you were describing things, um, I actually, I really like your reframing of what it is Vert Bakey says he's kind of after of, the, of a little bit more of an adjective, maybe verb than it is a noun. And that would be interesting. I would love to hear what he said, what he'd say about that. Do you feel like Bitcoin is a, is a candidate for a type of thing that could be a religion that is not a religion? Um, if, if, you, if you were to say, okay, let me, let me use Vert Bakey's terminology for a second. Is something like Bitcoin the type of thing that he's describing and maybe what he is kind of looking for? I don't, to be fair, I don't know his position on that particular topic well enough to comment there, but I can comment more broadly about the first part. And I think even it's, it's more instructive rather than to say, yeah, I think this thing will become a religion or that to say, what are the criteria for us to identify the things that are most meaningful in my life and potentially in other people's lives? And to extend on what we were talking about a second ago, what is the thing that inspires the greatest devotion? And what should we call that thing? I, I think in the past, or what is the thing that in, inspires the greatest sacrifice? you know, sacrificing your time and your energy and your resources to learning about it, contributing to it, acquiring it, bringing it into your own life, becoming it in a certain sense. Um, what do we call those things? And I think in, in the past, uh, they used, you know, terminology like God or hero or religion, or at least to parameterize the, you know, if not to specifically pinpoint these, I, like, 
I don't think Bitcoin is God because the notion of, of God is, is far more expansive than an isolated thing, right? It, you know, maybe God is like the ineffable force that brings order to everything. But I think it's an interesting, I think religions throughout the ages have attempted to um, investigate the relationship between human consciousness and the character of that grand order that, you know, makes everything the way that it is. And the things that are most representative of that character seem to garner devotion and sacrifice and worship and what have you. And as always, the, the proof is in the action, right? The proof is in the pudding. And so when I, one of the things that it's, you know, it's probably because just looking at Bitcoin and seeing the ways in which it's going to change the world and the institutions and all that kind of stuff, I don't think, like I wanted it, appreciated all the problems that we have, all that kind of stuff. I don't think it would have taken me to wherever the fuck I'm at right now with all this stuff. Uh, what I think has done that is noticing the behavior and in, importantly, the changes in behavior, even downright transformations that I've seen in so many people which is why I spend most of my time in this, like in Bitcoin land, speaking to people about those things. Because to me, those are the most interesting, consequential, relevant things. Like I'm, I, we all kind of get the monetary and the economic and the macro and the, all this case. What's really the, still the big question mark is what is causing this transformation in perspective and as a result in behavior and as a result in one's life and as a result in one's family and community, et cetera, et cetera. And so I go back to the, to the idea, maybe to, to switching the question rather than just asserting like, yes, I think this will happen or that'll happen. And this is that, or this is what are the criteria that we should be looking at to assign a certain word, a certain language, a certain, to determine what our relationship is to certain things. And to me, that question becomes, why is this thing garnering so much devotion? Why is it garnering so much sacrifice? Why is it instilling so much um, or fostering so much or uh, inspiring so much transformation, which it very evidently seems to be doing? And not just those things, but those things in the best, like in their best form, right? It's not fostering a disintegrated transformation, an evil and negative transformation, is fostering a transformation where people more consciously attempt to invite virtue into their life and integrate that virtue into themselves by, vir <laughs> by virtue of them seeing those virtues in this thing that is Bitcoin. And so, and not only that, but seeing how successful the implementation of those virtues are in that external thing and almost in a form of mimicry saying, why would not the integration of those virtues within myself be likewise successful and beneficial? And then the broader question is, if we're saying that both in that external domain, i.e. as instantiated in Bitcoin, and as if we integrate and use them within ourselves, if that leads to the best experience of life, or at least certainly the best one we've yet experienced, what does that say about the the truth or the eternality of those virtues across scales even broader than ourself and the external phenomenal world and beyond. And I think part of the, uh, the religious assertions in the past and ones that I've been toying with in relation to Bitcoin have been that those things, I think, it, I think it's reasonably uh, fair logic to say that whatever characterizes the unseen forces of order that deliver us into this reality, things that end up being successful in that reality, and successful is a bit of a, might have to unpack that a bit, but in, in the way we've been discussing, things that, that prove out such a, a beneficial result in that reality must be in some way integrated or connected to or fit to the broader pattern within which they are nestled. And if that's the case, and if in we're isolating these virtues, these virtues of truth, fairness, freedom, beauty. Uh, if we're confident in isolating them as almost primary constituents of these things that 
we're attempting to integrate, then can we not logically extend those virtues into the broader pattern in which we are embedded and say that they must be almost fundamental to you know to this to the the order of god right to the 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 nature of that notion uh, or that word that we've been using and you know i don't know obviously but logically it doesn't seem it doesn't seem illogical it seems worth exploring at least and if that's the case then yeah I can see Bitcoin being treated. I can see action in relation to Bitcoin being what we've just spent the last 15 minutes articulating as being religious. But that doesn't mean that I think it's going to turn into an institution of religion that we could both probably point out many of the different pitfalls and manners in which it's been corrupted. And as a result, has been uh, part of the reason why it's been disregarded or criticized or relatively diminished in the era that we exist in today. So those two things I would differentiate. But if the question is simply, you know, will Bitcoin become a religion? I think it already is. The matter is just scale. The matter is just how true, how beneficial is it? And if it is, the truer it is, probably the more the I would answer in the affirmative to, to your question. Yeah, that, um, there's a lot. There's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> As per usual, it's good. Uh, I really, I really like that. Um, so, a, a few things. I don't have much to disagree with, and and I think I like what we're doing, which is really pushing on the words, right? Because that really gets us into trouble. And I feel like the word religion is problematic, mm. straight up, in a number of ways. And I think one thing that you just described was, well. Well, first of all, religion does seem to be the thing that orients a large group of people around a certain set of practices, a certain set of beliefs, a certain set of kind of values um, that leads to good outcomes, let's say. Good being whatever deems to be maybe, you know, in, in conformity with uh, what is considered kind of right or lead, leads to out outcomes that people desire, right? Let's right. say. But it's an orienting force. It's a, it's a direction in which you're pointed I think you're you're usually quick to say, well, let's not put religion to first and foremost. Like God is ultimately, or whatever we call God, nature, the universe, the cosmos, whatever that mysterious force is bringing, you know, reality into existence. That is the ultimate kind of thing that I think everyone is after. The lens through which people are either seeing it or pursuing it, or the direction in which they're pointed towards trying to understand or grapple with this is maybe called maybe their religion, their belief structure, their mm -hmm. philosophy, right? Philosophy is another way of getting it. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, I, I, so I think, I don't know, religion is a very problematic, I think to your point, like if people use Bitcoin as a religion or you know, if they use it as a way of orienting themselves in such a way that leads to, the, leads to better outcomes and it's actually got the most kind of integrative, it's able to integrate best the different things that are required that seem to lead to the best outcomes. There's actually a lot of game theory parallels that I'm describing here. That's essentially what game theory is like, you know, once you get the incentives, right, you can just let it go. It's like a life form. It will, it will sort itself out. Like, well, if Bitcoin is the thing that does that for mysterious reasons that I know you are pursuing that I hope that you eventually find out the mystery behind why it is it even <laughs> does that, then yeah, it's serving the purpose of a religion, right? I'm reminded of, money honestly right um when people go down the rabbit hole of well what is money well bitcoin is money and gold is money i'm like well no like people use gold as money because it had a certain set of attributes and qualities that led it to be a, a good money right it didn't erode it didn't degrade you could do this and so like all looking at all the options they chose it as money maybe subconsciously maybe whatever but in it's a, it's a, it's an element. <laughs> That's what it is. And even then it's like, it, well, what, what is an atom? I don't know. Right. You can, you can probe down, but like, is it money? People use it as money, right? People use Bitcoin as money because it's, it's properties. It's, it, you know, lend it to being optimal for that. Right. That is the use that people have found. So again, they, they have a need and it has certain properties and out of that comes, it is used as money. I think you could say the same thing for religions. They are, something could be used as a religion. Um, and I think a religion is something well, 
here's the problem. And I think maybe this is why religion is problematic. It becomes problematic when it becomes so fixed and, it, and dogma sets in and rules become inviolable and it loses mm. its flexibility, you know, and, and now I'm going to bring in some na nature metaphors, right? But when it doesn't bend, when it doesn't, you know, uh, breathe, when there is no, you know what I mean, dynamic mm -hmm. kind of envelope or room, it becomes a, a fixture, it becomes fixed and it can snap, it can break. And, and I think that's when it becomes problematic. That's, you know, in nature, that's when things die. But I, I think what we tend to say, oh, that's a religion. It's something that has become so fixed and, 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 and rigid over time. It becomes problematic. I think you can say the same for honestly anything, but mm -hmm. I think that it should be something that is sufficient, that integrates elegantly a lot of the things that lead to good outcomes. And it's something through which people can act or view or point themselves that will, I think, marshal the best outcomes with, with a few inputs. Right. So um, yeah, I, I, I do. I'm, I'm, I think it's very interesting to think of something used as a religion or something having religious properties or, or behaving, you behaving religiously. Um, it's just a more useful way to talk about some of these things. I think there's a lot of baggage that the word has too. So, um, you know, I see Verbeke struggling with it, but um, I think we all do, right? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you could even say it's a bit of a stretch and I think it, it will seem like more of a stretch it is just because of how much baggage <clears throat> the language currently carries. But you could even say religion is the motive for action. You know, we might say that value is now. Why do you cross the road? Because you value what's on the other side more. But, and, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about this issue at the moment, but, um, you know, what is religion but the highest value? And what do you attempt to do to that? You attempt to allow it to orient your behavior, right? Because if it, if you truly believe it's the highest value, you want to either move toward it or invite more of it into you so that it can for foster that integration and foster the outcomes that result from such a integration. And so, you know, religion, rather than, as you say, being a noun, uh, religion simply being what you, you know, another word for the motive for action. And again, then you're in the, the, the arena of saying, well, what's, what are the best motives? And part of the answer to that question is, well, what are the best outcomes? You know, so if you want to know the best motives, you got to know the best outcomes. And then, you know, wh when you were speaking, you you mentioned, you know, the good, right? And that is that's a motherfucker, right? Because what 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 we're saying is like, well, whatever fosters the most good is the truest truth, is the 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 most the highest, the greatest value is the strongest motive is religion. Well, you know what is good. You know, and how do we how do we pin that down? And I think one of the ways that you pin that down is just through eons of observation, right? Say like, well, what were these people motivated by? What was their, you know, what was their orienting value and what was the result? And over time you get to see that. And I do think this has been part of the development of religious narrative and representation generally, has been to say, like, all right, well, we've been watching things for quite a while. Like, what what have we learned? Oh, we've learned, you know. These values, you know, let's let's say what we were talking about before, like simply self-serving, self-aggrandizing orientation, not conducive to to generative, harmonious outcomes, let's say, but another set of values far more productive of a type of paradise, right? A type of harmony between things, not a utopia, but in that direction rather than the opposite in the direction of integration rather than the direction of disintegration and so that's helped us to tr kind of elucidate you know the good and you know here's here's a bigger stretch but in relation to bitcoin to the extent that we can tease out some of the principles and values that went into its architecture and one you know a, a basic one that's not very controversial that, that i often bring up is simply that everyone is treated equally, right? There's no favorable treatment within the system. So there's a, there's an inherent fairness there. And then of course you could say there's, there's also uh, the value of truth is, is seen as being paramount to that in, in, in terms of, you know, something that is said is not able to be altered or 
very, 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 very difficult to be altered. And that is, uh, that produces a desired or a good or a harmonious or a generative or an integrated outcome, then we can, perhaps it's the case that like when such things, such phenomena, be they uh, human generated or not, we can use them to tease out what might be the highest virtues, values, or motives that are most representative of quote unquote, the good. And then, then we try it out when we see if it works, as you say, like then game theory and competition and everything takes over in the chaos of the unfolding of reality, what values and their associated behaviors take over, which ones, are the most generative, which ones are the most successful. And you almost have to have an inherent faith in the good to think that that process is going to work out well, right? Because if, if you don't, you might think, well, you know, power is, it can be the ultimate uh, decider of competition. And so the thing that's most powerful, the thing that's most capable of imposing its will will consume the world and consume reality. Or and so that I think that you have to take that on faith, or you might have an alternative faith and say, no, I actually think good is more fundamental to the chaos of, of the reality that we contend with. And as a result, I think it given, I think that over time, it is what wants to emerge and it is what is emerging and, you know, with our participation. But I think there's a faith there that's saying that if you allow the truth of reality to play itself out over time, what emerges incrementally, increasingly with greater uh, complex complexification or beauty or what have you is something, is a representation of the notion that we understand as the good. And, you know, again, maybe that's wrong, but it seems a little bit right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're drawing a little bit of a, a connection between what's true and what's good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I know for me personally that the, the trueness, the tr truth for me is the aspect of Bitcoin that is the most attractive to me. That is the f grounding foundational value. Tr truth is, is no more problematic, no less problematic than good. That is a tricky, thorny, right? right. But that it's something you can trust and it is a true thing in a, in a world full of, of obfusc obfuscation and lies and things like this does seem like the germ of a thing that can be leaned upon. Um, again, something I think you talk a lot about, and I think you described it very well, is that um, truth is, is also that which can't be changed, right? It's the invariant, which means everything around it has to change. It's like a, you know, it's like a constant in, a, in, a, in an equation and the variables then need to be kind of like altered. Um, I do think truth serves that that purpose. I think con connecting which is truth why you might say that truth truth is the prime generator of order because because yes. of its inviolability, it forces yes. order to coalesce around it. Yes, exactly. And I, and I think that's and I think when we are looking, I think that's what people who look to religion are also trying. They're, I think that's what they're looking for. What does it all mean? What what is true? Like what where can I find something I can rely on as mm. true? I think when we say like oh I want to rely on this like what can I trust and you're looking for a solid something solid that you can at least lean on and it's not going to change that so again I described the fixedness of religion as being part of why it was um, such a harmful force but I think people are looking for something solid something in, invariant mm -hmm. and I want to draw a distinction between invariant right and a constant and something that is too rigid. I think those are two different concepts. Um, but I think people are looking for that. What is the invariant? What is true? And I think religion offers some answers. Um, the closest thing to an answer that a lot of people have, um, you could argue Bitcoin does the same thing, but I think people, when they are going through the meaning crisis, what does it all mean? Like, what even is anything? What, what, where am I pointing? Where, what am I orienting myself towards? Right. How do I, if I don't know what, where I'm orienting myself, I don't know how to make decisions. And he, you know, Verveke talks about decisions as if you break down that word, it's the cutting off of something. Mm. It's when you literally, you know, it's like the, you have now eliminated those possibilities, every possibility except this. And now you're going down. Well, that, that's a very consequential action. It's a lot of, mm -hmm. there's a lot riding on a decision because you can't do those things anymore. You've made a decision. Well, how do I make decisions if I don't even know what's true? What is true? Right. Um, I don't know. I, that's a, that, these are huge questions, right? These are massive <laughs> questions. And I think that's why people are, see something like a religion or something that is acting as a religion for someone. And people say, you know what? 
50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. Right. This one right. seems to be something that is helping a lot of people. I only have so many hours in a day. Let me, let me choose this thing. It is. A, and that's why it's, I think it's a crisis. It's, it's something that yeah. is very difficult. Yeah, totally. I mean, definitely there's a hunger for it. There's an, again, as we've been saying, there's a necessity for it. And I do think, first of all, I want to say that um, I am not currently like rejecting any religious faith that's out there, be it Christianity yes, or Hinduism or anything like that. I'm have a tremendous amount of respect for all of them. I can be critical of certain actions of those institutions throughout time. And I am, and, you know, maybe critical of other aspects, but I'm not at all ready to dispense with the core, what I feel is the core um, wisdom contained in them and the core yeah. truths contained in them. What I'm trying to do is, well, find a synthesis, I guess, between them all that is, that is the most true. And I think yeah. to your point that we all, there's such a hunger for that. And like you said, I mean, 50 million Elvis, uh, <laughs> you know, followers can't be wrong, but I do think it, it's interesting just as we were looking at etymology, it's interesting to look at phraseology or whatever it means when you look at like, you know, sayings across any domain really, but certainly across religious narrative, because, you know, like the example with devotion earlier, like usually you would think of that, if, you, if I just use that term devotion, like devotional practice, you would think, oh, spirituality, religion. But if I said, well, I'm devoting my, all my time lately to Bitcoin, you maybe those wouldn't have been conjured up, but the, the, the same, they're the same thing. If, effectively, this, the action is the same. And, you know, when my point that I'm trying to make here is, I think when we see in religions, you know, ideas like you, you will hold no gods before me, or you will not fall prey to idol worship, or you will not, uh, you know, I'm a jealous God and these, this sorts of terminology, again, I'm, a, you know, I'm speculating, but I, I, I can see a logic behind the use of that type of language to stress the importance of not getting it wrong hmm. because you could become, a uh, a follower of the Elvis religion. Mm. And that would be suboptimal. That would, if there is any truth to be found in the universe, then that would be following a lesser, that would be acting religiously in reference to a lesser truth. And as a result, that would elucidate lesser outcomes, lesser good, less good outcomes. And so the point is, is to try to orient yourself to the truest truth, to the highest value, and allow that to be the motivator for your actions such that they are optimized for elucidating the most good. And I mean, obviously that's quite the undertaking, but I think that's why the religious question is the prime responsibility of every single human being on earth that's ever lived and that ever will live. And part of the, the, the danger and the pitfalls of institutionalizing religion is that it makes available an answer that is far too easy and that doesn't require the requisite discipline and challenge and strife and struggle and journey to find out the truth for yourself. And you've simply adopted another form of fiat. Say, oh, okay, well, you say it, this is the truth. Well, it's a great point. Then it's the truth. It's a great point. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's so much of what you're describing to the pursuit of truth. That's what science is, right? We're just trying to find out what's true. Einstein's theory of relativity is the closest thing to true. It'll be overturned. It's not the truth, right? Newton's is true at a certain scale. It's still true. It's not the truth. It's not the most true. It doesn't have all, you know, and I think we've heard a lot of these comparisons. And I think, I think a scientist who's acting with integrity always has that question mark handy, right? Never certain. Maybe this is the closest we've gotten so far. This is as much as we know. Um, there's a lot more to know, right? Um, that is an honest scientist. That's someone who's interrogating reality as best they can. And I think people interrogate reality in a number of ways. I think philosophy is doing the same thing. What is true? What does it even mean to be true, right? These are, everyone's, again, I think, I think pursuing that question in their own way. And that's, that's when yourself comes into play. How can I uniquely pursue that question? But I think what you described um, is an important thing to remember, which is that the pursuit of answering these questions, for instance, the pursuit of me completing this um, Meaning Crisis series, it's it's the act of taking notes, which means I'm just lis I'm listening very deliberately and I'm pausing and I'm writing some things down, putting them in my own words, very painstakingly. Uh, it's the process of that that has been the most rewarding. 
where 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 he ended up where, the conclusions he reached to that is not I'm not trying to say the journey is means more than a destination. I'm saying that there is something in the pursuit of these large questions that um, you start to learn. Ah, that's a good question to ask. That's not a helpful question to ask. This is a this is an, a, a more optimal way of doing things. That's a less optimal way. There's a spirit of improvisation, but experimentation happening, and that in the process of going through this, and it's a daily choice and a daily act. Uh, it's that process that is the most helpful. So what the thing is that's orienting you towards doing this, this daily thing is, is maybe subservient to, I think, the important thing, which is you going through the process of asking these questions and uh, making sense, you know, of these things um, and, and, and whatever can get you to, to start to piece things together. When, when you make sense of things, you're integrating things together in a way that conforms in a way that feels good for you. And I don't know, I think there's, it's the act. We're back into verb territory, right? Mm -hmm. And I think too much mm -hmm. emphasis gets placed on these nouns, these institutions, the dogmas, the rules of this. It's like, yes, it's the, it's the you know, if you were an arrow, you know, you're, that, that is where you should be pointing, but that is not the point. Um, and I think the more we can appreciate that, what I think what happens is, and maybe this is what caused the meaning crisis, I don't know, too much emphasis on the things, the nouns, the, the thing, and they become emblems, they become artifacts, right? There's a, probably a lot of, there's a lot of uh, parallels or rather, um, you know, myths and, and adages about that. But uh, when they take precedence, mm. that, that, that is when the corrosive process starts. People have lost, they've lost sense, they've lost touch, they've lost perspective with what that was for. Um, and I think things start to kind of spiral from there because now, yeah, things have become dis, I think, integrated. Um, but yeah, that, I, I, I do think there's something about the, the truth, what that is, how, you know, how can we get closer to it? How can we better understand the world? And what are the questions we can do? What are the things we can do to best get at that? I think philosophy has been one, science has been one, religion has been one. And I often like to check in with myself every so often and say, what have I been wrong about? What was I wrong about? What have I changed my mind about? Maybe is a better way to say it, right? And one thing I think in recent years, not recently, but maybe it's five, past five or 10 years is what, what you said about religion. You know, I think I was way too quick to dismiss it as ridiculous, harmful, destructive, and mostly a vestigial something that we kind of carried with us. And I think, um, that's a, that's a good step towards saying, okay, you know, uh, I think dismissing anything is, is a very, it's a very, that, that decision, that cutting off point is probably not the best thing. There's never, never fully dismiss something, you know, try to understand it's, it's been preserved for a long time. What is there? What was it serving? How is it helping? And that's something I've changed my mind about for sure. Uh, I know it sounds like either you never changed your mind about it and your door was always open, but it's something that you're, I think maybe open to in a way that a lot of people aren't, they, they're not. And I get why, but I think that there's value there. So. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I was never, uh, I always knew the kind of hubris or arrogance of being totally closed minded. So the door was always ajar. but in my initial, you know, investigation of it, um, I carried a certain arrogance about it being like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is going to be a bunch of nonsense, but I'm going to, go through the motions anyway, just so I can prove to myself, you know, I'm intellectually honest or something like that. And, um, you know, then that, that, that process has been on, ongoing for many years and, you know, here we are, but I think there, there's two things that you mentioned that I wanted to touch on. And one was, again, if we're going back to the idea that religion is simply action, it's just how your action is constituted, you know, the scientists is almost no less religious. You know, in, in one sense, they still need words and ideas and terms and all of this kind of stuff to contextualize and understand that the world they're in. You know, how is the Big Bang any different than God, really? It's meant to, to say, this is the creative moment. This is the creative force of order. Now, science, uh, and again, like you, I'm, I'm grateful for this, helps us to elucidate, gain greater clarity over all those forces that coalesce to create uh, what we experience. But that doesn't contradict, you know, uh, or doesn't really elucidate any greater clarity on, on the source. You know, I, st I still think we'll, we, we use similar words. There's a different lexicon in science, but is how it orients action really any different? 
and for the context that it's in? And the answer might be no. And like a simple one is a lot of, let's say an altruistic scientist and not just motivated by, you know, working at Pfizer or something like that. But uh, let's say they're looking into cancer research or life extension or whatever, trying to ameliorate any of the medical conditions that befall us. Um, one of the underlying values motivating forces of their behavior must be that there is a certain value ascribed to human life. It's going to maybe be different for all people, but what you're saying is life valuable and that orients your action to a certain degree. And so you right there is like a religious presupposition mm -hmm. that life is valuable Accident, and it helps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it helps orient some of your action. And so I, that just to kind of, speculator raised the point that um, I don't think the the difference is in language oftentimes and not kind. Yes. And where we get tripped up is thinking that the difference in language is representative of a difference in kind or a difference in nature or a difference in mechanics. When I don't really think it is, it's just two different domains and a similar language being ascribed to the different motivating forces within those domains. And so I hope as we move forward into a, a saner era, brought on by Bitcoin, that will, we will continue to have these discussions and hopefully uh, gain greater clarity on, on how those two things can be brought together. And then on your point about um, you know, kind of the, the journey is the destination thing, I actually think that's not cliche and trite. I think that's fundamentally true. And the reason is, is because as we've been discussing, you know, action is the thing. Action yes. is the thing we need to be looking at. And when you are engaged in that journey, when your action is motivated by some ideal principle, value, motive, be it love, be it peace, be it freedom, be it truth, be it your own self-aggrandizement, whatever it is, when you act, you're serving that. And as a result of, of doing that, you become that thing, right? You, you, you're, it, you're, you're saying to that principle, animate me and guide me towards you in my actions, basically. And by doing that, the process of doing that becomes uh, the destiny. Like, if, if that's what you want, if you want to bring more love into your life and you want to bring more truth and freedom and that kind of stuff, and then you orient your action to it, you're basically feeding off the very thing that you're trying to become or move towards. And then, you know, the kind of the offshoots is just, you know, whatever uh, is created or whatever is generative as a result of your moving through a physical world, let's say, or, or your interactions in that world. And so, and then let's say you come to some sort of conclusion or you finish some, something, you finish that work, the action stops for a sense and you say, oh, I've, I accomplished it now. This, this was the goal. But no, because once you've accomplished it and you stop the action, you're no longer, it's no longer animating you. Now it's, you've, you're separated from it. Look what I did. There's a space between you and the products of your action. And maybe, and they might be beautiful, of course. Like I think the idea of the cathedral is, and I'm romanticizing this to some extent, because I know, you know, people that didn't want to be involved in such things were forced to be involved. But basically you're saying like, I want, I want my action to be devoted to the, the, the thing that the principles or the values or motives that I think are most true. And maybe it's like the truth of God and the beauty of God and the, and the, the liberating force that is God. And I want to be involved in, in a physical instantiation or representation of those principles, regardless of the cost to me. And so every day I go and I'm building this medieval cathedral or I'm, Da Vinci or whomever, and I'm architecting the, the, you know, and bringing to bear so much. This is the irony too. I mean, cathedrals and religious monuments of the past were the most advanced scientific structures in the world. They, you know, the architecture, the mathematics, the, phys the physics, all that, they were the places where they came together the most. Um, but when, when they're done, they have their own like freestanding beauty, but there's now a separation between you and it because the way in which you were devoting yourself to actualize it has come to at least a temporary end. And so, you know, again, long-winded, highly speculative way of saying, I think that the, the journey being the destination is true because while you're acting, that's the only time you're ever a true representation of the motivating principle or value. Yeah.
Yeah, we're, we're back to Mises' human action, right? Literally, it's it's the seed on which an entire theory of economics was built, right? Human action. Man acts, you know? And that act is a, is a, is evidence of um, want, right? They, otherwise, they wouldn't have, you know, acted. Out of that germ comes an entire rich, you know, uh, very, um, I think, predictive, you know, and, and uh, helpful theory, right, of economics. So, I, I do. I, I mean, most of what we're talking about is, is interesting how it leads us back. Right. You talked about how the word we use. I, I often say, too, if people are talking about something religious. And by the way, a lot of these theologians were also philosophers and scientists. It's only recently, yeah, absolutely. And recently things got disintegrated, you know, and it means <laughs> separated. And I don't know how much of the, that has to do with the problem that we're experiencing here. Um, even the buildings you're talking about, we, they, they talk about from a physical standpoint, from an architectural standpoint, if a building has integrity, it's a right. strong, solid substance. I, I mean, a building is evidence of integrity. That is what it, a building is, right? It's when everything comes together harmoniously and is strong uh, and has a foundation and is built on top of a strong foundation, right? These become metaphors. These become words we use interchangeably. Um, but again, you know, we, we come back to you know, acting, taking action. The verb is is the most important thing here, right? Um, and I think we're also coming back to the importance of language um, and communicating with people because that is how acting man <laughs> coordinates with other acting men and i say man meaning men woman whatever um how dare you what's that how dare I, you i know i <laughs> apologize so, you know um it's funny because you read a lot of these old books and you start to use the same kind of like you know what i mean terminology they use um uh no but i, I think this idea of language I don't, it, language is not trivial and uh it, you know verviki talks about it a lot you know i am always been deeply steeped in in really language is a big common denominator for me in a lot of the work that I study um informally I'm not saying you know I'm a, a scholar by any means but um what words mean the words we use for things is very important it's how we coordinate with other people um also don't think it's a coincidence that people have time and again talked about money as a form of of communication it's a signal that we use right it's a price signal that we use to coordinate with other people to the extent that it's not truthful and we can't trust it Miss uh, malinvestment, miss you know, misallocated resources happen, and and they propagate through the system. But that is also a form of communication. It's how we communicate value to one another. It's a communications medium. It's a communications protocol. Same with languages. It's a protocol, just like Bitcoin. Um, it's language. It's words. It, it's it's lang language is so important. And to and I think you know if people struggle with this is what I was getting at when I was talking about the, uh, the theologians who were also philosophers, who were also scientists. Um, if people have a problem with the word God, I just say substitute in nature, say mother nature. It, it works. Everything works. Put in, put in nature. That, that's what I mean. And you say, okay, I can do that. <laughs> Everything else say the same, right? But it shows like people can get hung up on words and if you use the wrong word. And so if nothing else, I think that if we can get people to just um, be a little bit more deliberate and think about the words they're using. Cause again, it's all we have, right? We're back at semantics, meaning making, awakening from the meaning crisis, the meaning of words. When we look at what is that common denominator? What are we really after here? It's like, look, the important thing is to act, you know, to do things that that is where the real truth lies in terms of um, some, some of the only true things is like what, what we can know is kind of what we're doing. But if we want to coordinate with other actors, other people acting, you need to communicate with them somehow. You to use a communications protocol. Mm -hmm. You use some kind of communication protocol, which is a language. Language is a type of communication protocol. These things are important. Um, they're just really important. And I think people are very dismissive. And I don't think they look closely at the words they're using in terms of, and, and I mean them, I mean, philosophically, I mean, um, I think, I think people think about language. I just think they take it for granted. That's all. I'm not trying to put too much um, scrutiny on language. I'm just saying, it is in many ways the base layer of a lot of things. I, I wrote a piece for Citadel 21 on Bitcoin and music. Um, I, I came at it from a music and a liberal arts perspective. Music is another thing that we use to improvise with other musicians, but you have to use the same um, language, the, the same system, and it has to be grounded in a key to the extent that you don't, you're not playing in the same key. You're untethered from a home base of sorts, a tonal home base. Mm. Things become untethered. You, you need you need that common you need that common denominator and I think a lot of things 
start to spiral, become disintegrated when you you you've you've lost that foundation. You've lost you've lost touch with it. I, I would yeah. Say. yeah, and I think that's as we've been discussing that speaks to the importance of a fundamental thread or common yeah. denominator or you know golden thread or whatever you want to call it. The thing yeah. that amongst all of those disparate means of communicating and potential integrations, what is the thing that fosters most of it? What is the thing that, that brings most of them together that that makes the mo that makes the, the the various disparate domains that we interact with most coherent? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's probably a lot of wisdom to be derived from both the pursuit of that and to the extent that it's found or to the degree that it's found, the integration of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is the other interesting thing. Like, you know, when you find just at you, what you just said is a perfect example of this. It seems to be the case that, you know, you may be able to judge the validity of a given truth or the depth of it, perhaps, uh, by virtue of how it helps to foster coherence across domains. You know, like you're you're making this case about language, but because of that perspective that you've generated on the importance of language, how it fits together, how it's developed, all that kind of stuff, you're able to look at a, a, diff a different domain in music, but you're able to see similar fittedness, similar patterns, and similar under underlying fundamentals. And you can almost see like, oh, there's a similar mechanics happening here. The, the product at a higher level is somewhat different, but I'm able to see a through line of, of, of truth in a certain sense. And, you know, that's extremely both adaptively advantageous and whatever the word to use is to say that something that enriches life, because you're able to see the majesty in things more easily. You're able to see the order in things more easily. You're able to see how the beauty is conjured up in things more easily, I think. And so, you know, it has tremendous advantage and which is why I think part of the reason why truth, broadly speaking, has been such a central pursuit for so long in cultures, regardless of how sophisticated their quote unquote religious systems have been developed mm -hmm. because, you know, well, as the pragmatists would say, you know, truth is the end of inquiry. If you just want to leave it at that and be like, well, it's, it's super important for that reason, because you're saying like, I have an end in my mind and the way that I get to it, the most expediently and the most efficiently is with the greatest approximation of truth that I can garner. And, you know, then it, it just, it complexifies and, uh, and beautifies and extends out from there. I think, you know, I think what you just described it just reminded me that it's not like people in pursuit of truth are under the delusion that they're going to get it. Maybe they will. I, don't, I think most people would admit that they probably won't. Um, do they think they're getting closer to it? They do, but you know, it could be layers of illusion in to on top of illusion. This na the nature of perspective being what it is. Um, but again, it's the pursuit of it that tends to lead it does tend to lead to outcomes that appear to reflect a more truer understanding of reality. We get better at manipulate, interacting with our world, manipulating our world, understanding the properties of certain elements. We can use them better. They become better tools. And I mean that in the broadest sense. And now we can kind of, you know, um, I think take action on, on our will and our ideas and our conceptual ideas a little bit better and things. So I think the pursuit of truth, even though we might never attain it, is still worthwhile. Again, we keep peeling back something that appears to be layers towards something that is a little bit more true. Um, and I think what people can maybe find discouraging in this pursuit, which I think, again, is, is the type of thing that the awakening from the meaning crisis is, is addressing, is that it can be discouraging. We'll never get there. We'll never, you know, it's like chasing the horizon. We'll never, we'll never reach truth. And so what's the point, right? Well, mm -hmm. the point is in the, it's the pursuit. It is. It's the pursuit that leads to a lot of breakthroughs and a lot of improvements um, it, on a number of dimensions. And so again, it's that orient, if we orient ourselves towards that goal of towards pursuing something that's true, good, um, you, you mentioned, you know, love is another word that, you know, big, it's lofty. If it gets taken to be the destination, it can be super problematic and corrosive, but it is also a value that expresses a lot of integrative um, helpfulness, you know, and, and a lot of integrative value to it. Um, 
yeah, I think it's the act of pursuing these things um, as long as we're oriented in the right direction that can lead to a lot of good things. And, and I think outcomes that I think are desirable for the person who's trying to, you know, is, is in pursuit of good outcomes. So again, it's, it's something that I can see in the way that we're talking about things, things can be some can become so lofty that they can, I can see how someone could find it discouraging or completely, yeah. you know, and I'm, and for some reason, I don't find it discouraging. I find it super <laughs> inspiring. I feel like you probably do too. Maybe it's just a curious nature, but I could see how it does take on that trait if you're not careful. So um, I, yeah. I think I, I understand what you're saying. But I do think that's representative of feedback to put you on, because I think hmm. pursuing truth and devoting oneself to perhaps the greatest approximation that they can comprehend uh, is has a sustaining is has a sustaining um, effect, like it 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 what I'm starting to appreciate, and this is only, you know, in recent years in relation to Bitcoin, which, you know, kind of reflects on the questions being asked earlier, but, and not exclusively, I shouldn't, I don't want to overdo it, but it's certainly, I've, I've gained greater clarity on what seems to be unfolding in relation to what's going on with Bitcoin. But I think like, if you're on that path, if it seems challenge, like, I gotta be careful my, with my words here because challenges are part and parcel with it all the time. You and you you encounter impediments and roadblocks and all that kind of stuff. But the broader point I'm I'm not so well making is I feel like when you are pursuing the good or the true in it, you know, and you're on the right path, there's an incredible sustaining effect of that where. Just by virtue, even if like you're never going to reach it, even if you, the, the carrot on the stick is always just out of out of reach, just by virtue of having aligned yourself in that manner with that creative force, and then as a result, inviting that in and through you, there's something deeply self-sustaining about that. And, and yeah, and that's my comment on that. And I think that's also a, a, a broader comment on truth. You could also say truth is not only the thing that's absolute but it's also the the thing that's most sustaining you know in a very uh mundane sort of example is like you know if a central government dictates like well we need to build fill in the blank a, a school a hospital or this or that out in the middle of nowhere just because it's part of our mandate and we think it's good if it's if something emerges as a result of that kind of uh, imposition, but it's not reflective of all the various actions and motivating values and all that kind of stuff that are existing in the place where it's being imposed. Eventually, when the the lifeblood or the support of the Im imposing uh, for like force or faction is removed, that thing is no longer sustained because it wasn't generated from the truth of the values and the, the, the motivations and the actions of the place where it was put. And, and so I think that the same is true for, for deep truth in that you, you kind of, you can, you, it may be a hint that you're on the right path and you're getting closer. The degree to which simply by virtue of being on the path instills in you a sustaining feeling. So not only that it's generating you know, quote unquote, always good outcomes, because of course it won't, but your alignment with it is almost satisfactory enough. Like it, it, it's, it, and, you know, again, if we, if we delve into religious or narrative language, you know, um, the eternal wellspring of fill in the blank of truth of love, you know, that, that kind of idea of the eternal spring, uh, emerges in in lots of different traditions and i think it's partially for that reason that that's one of the qualities of truth it's because of its its fit right because of its proper integration with all the different unfolding forces that exist in the world it's able to continue recurring it's able to continue sustaining itself um and that's cert that's been a feeling or a sensation that i've only recently started to appreciate or recognize within myself that's interesting. I, I want um, 
I want to believe that's universal. I want to believe that that is a trait that truth has, you know, um, it certainly has, a, you know, it's again, it's, if it's an invariant, if it's the thing that doesn't change, well, then that means it could, you know, it could serve as a fulcrum to something. I and mean, it's also something you can push against. I mean, I always say things like friction, like friction goes by another name, which is uh, grip, right? It's what mountain climbers use to you know, get up mountains. Like you need resistance mm -hmm. to things and that there is something sustaining about that it's an interesting concept, right? And I want to, and I think, I think I totally can relate to what you're describing. I know exactly what you're describing and I can relate to that. My, my question is, do you, how much of that do you think is a function of who we are as people, the nature of our own per perception and our own interpretation of things that we derive a sustaining quality from these pursuits? Um, I'm reminded of, you know, when you see these amazing photographs taken from deep space from our most advanced telescopes and some people's initial reaction is oh my god we're so insignificant you know and other people's reaction is oh my god this is so inspiring they think rockets or they think oh that's a piece of me um mm -hmm. in fact we couldn't even be perceiving this if we didn't have eyes and brains the perception process wouldn't even have happened like how inspiring look at the type of things we can build well that's a function of the person who, <laughs> who saw that photo um you know, awe and insignificance are like right next to each other. And I don't know if they feed off one another or what, but what do you think about like, do some people in pursuit of truth actually feel the opposite of what you're describing? Um, and it's intimidating and scary. And they actually, maybe they run the other way and do who knows what in pursuit of the opposite, or they just get scared off the path. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that's a great example or analogy between awe and insignificance. And, you know, you might say that one of the requirements for true awe or wonder is your own yes <laughs> insignificance you know so it's like are they even different i mean it's just like is it just purely a matter of your perspective because mm -hmm. if you're truly kind of experiencing rapture experiencing awe all of your notion of of the self right all of these self -refer referential ideas are almost like they're flooded away because they they can't be held in in simultaneous tension with the thing that's flooding you with, you know, with being, you know, or what, you know, whatever language you want to use. So that's really interesting. Very interesting. But my, my reflexive answer to your question is, of course, like, I think everyone has this capacity because I think it's how human consciousness interacts with the reality before us, whatever it might be constituted of it by no means is a guarantee that everyone will experience it because, and this is the beautiful thing is that our agency, our approach, our intent, our refinement actually matters. And mm -hmm. fuck, I mean, if it didn't, presumably we'd just be automata of some kind, you know? So it's, we would, as is often the case is often made, like, you know, if you didn't know what hell was, you, you know, how could you even define heaven? If you didn't know good, how could you define bad, light, dark, you know, positive, negative, all that stuff. Um, so I, I do think that sensation is fundamental and available to everyone. But as all of these mythic narratives elucidate, um, the hero's journey requires persistence, courage, uh, curiosity, uh, like principled endeavor or ambition, you know, all these things are wrapped up in this. And I think the reason why they're there is because we've, you know, our species has observed for a long time that those are the qualities required to access those sorts of states mm. that are ultimately beneficial, but mm. by no means guaranteed. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. That it, that it rewards the qualities that that are capable of facing something like truth or being in pursuit of truth and being inspired by it because they derive you know certain benefits from it um hmm, that's interesting yeah i mean playing playing with this idea of in an effort to strive to well i mean action is just it's unavoidable that action is becoming in every moment, right? Like in the moment you decide to be courageous in the face of fear, you are courage. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to be, you're not, 
like it's not still an image in your mind like that's just what you are in that moment for however long you decide to maintain it and uh and so this is the kind of weird circularity that i tried to articulate before of presumably presu presumably like this attempt that we've been making to elucidate or at least you know comment on the importance of clarity around certain grand values or fundamental truths um the, like so them being an ambition let's say um and then the very process of striving towards them being their actualization mm. and so you you like and this is why I, I the the comment that the journey is the destination is because like the moment you decide that you're going to try to align yourself or attain those perhaps lofty principles or values, you almost already have done so. It's maybe it's just a matter of degree, and that's that, that's why you continue running the clock forward and 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 delving into the unknown to see to what extent you might be able to do it at a greater degree maybe i don't know it's it's not it's not super clear in my mind but i think there's something there i think it's great i think um that the pursuit when you how do i put this <laughs> when you pursue you have an important part to play in this whole thing this gets me back to one of the things that i get out of out of verveke's work is that your perspective and you have an important part to play in this meaning making enterprise and you might say that something like truth out there in the world, this platonic notion of like this trueness or whatever is true in the world, the truth that all the scientists are trying to get closer to and all the theologians and all these things, um, you might think, no, that's, that is an objective truth. And I am someone who am trying to get closer to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have an important part to play in the truth, both the pursuit towards it, you know, but the, what, what it is that is valuable about pursuing the truth is what you become when you pursue it and when you pursue it honestly and, exactly. that, and that you become true, right? You, you, we use this term in, in shooting in archery, right? When your shot is true, it's aligned, it's, it's lined up and it's integrated with the destination. Well, it's the trueness of that, that, that you, become, you become that. You become aligned with it because you are actually in pursuit of it in order to hit the target need to be aligned with the trajectory that's a i think it's a profound insight that like the reason why pursuit of truth is important is not so much that you'll attain it or that it exists out there in the world is that it, it's what it does to you in the pursuit of it i think there is a lot of truth to what you truth truth to what, <laughs> what, what, what that that idea that you're playing with i think there's a lot of good things going on there and that it suggests that you know, look you know does that mean truth is subjective that it differs depending on the person um well different people change. Yeah. I mean, change is an important part of this, but um, we're, we're aligning ourselves towards what we think is true. And out of that comes the benefit. I think, it, I think that's an important thing. I don't think people talk about it a lot in that, maybe in those terms, but I don't know, maybe they should. Um, yeah. That truth, we talk about religion being, well, that's, it's a noun, it's an institution. No, no, no. You do things religiously. It's like, yeah, you do things with truth. You do things truthfully. You do mm. things, you know, and it's a, it's a similar analogy, I would say, that maybe the value of that in word comes to life when you use it more as a verb and as an, as, as an adjective. Yeah, and, and maybe religion is just trying to construct a type of architecture or guide to inform that process um, in some capacity, such that you might... Yeah, system. yeah, such that you might engage it more efficiently, more effectively, more successfully more quickly, something like that. I think like if that. you use I, things like religions and philosophies as um, art, uh, scaffoldings, you know, as frameworks for getting somewhere, I think that's that's probably a good, that's that's where that's how I like to think of them. Yeah. 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 You, the way you articulated that in, in reference to, you know, the arrow and the target, I think was spot on, very well articulated. Maybe we should end it there. I think it's a nice place to end it. I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you coming on, man. This is a really enjoyable conversation. Help me um, get some greater clarity on some things that I've been mulling over. So I appreciate you for that. And uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. We'll give ourselves, um, you know, six to 12 months to <laughs> see, see what, chew on some things for a while and see where we end up. And then we can get back together again and, and see what we came up with.
There you go. That sounds great. All right, brother. Take care. Take care, John. See ya.